The Travel Transformation Podcast is proud to be partnered with Give the Goodness Global, an amazing global outreach project helping families in need all over Southeast Asia and beyond. Please check them out at instagram.com forward slash give the goodness global today. And now on to the podcast episode. Welcome to the Travel Transformation Podcast, where we talk all things travel and all things transformation, exploring the life-changing potential of solo travel, intentional travel, and location-independent working. Whether you're an aspiring digital nomad or simply wish to boost your confidence through epic travel experiences, I'm here to motivate and inspire you to go after all your wildest dreams. I'm Jessica Grace Coleman, author, certified travel coach, founder of the Travel Transformation Company, and your host for the Travel Transformation Podcast. Travel changed my life. Now let's change yours. You ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Travel Transformation Podcast, where we talk all things travel and all things transformation. My name is Jessica Grace Coleman, and I'm your host. And today I'm talking to elite level athlete and peak performance and motivational mindset teen life coach, Jack Murray. Jack is a 15 year old elite level athlete from Canada playing first division soccer in the Portuguese youth football system. He is also a motivational mindset and high performance coach, primarily for teen athletes. His aim is to help young people reach their goals, get rid of anxiety and bounce back from difficult situations by teaching them the tools of positivity, perspective, courage, comeback strategies and using inspiring analogies. Now, Jack is by far the youngest guest I've ever had on my podcast. Not that you'd be able to tell by listening to this interview. When I was 15, I was hanging out in internet chat rooms and looking forward to that week's episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer on TV. Yes, I was a really cool teen. (laughs) Jack is already doing so many incredible things, are really helping so many other people. So I know he's going to be so successful in life and I'm really glad he came on the podcast. In this episode, we discuss Jack's journey from Canada to Portugal to play Division I soccer, his work around coaching teen athletes, the importance of mindset, including visualization, confidence, and gratefulness, his love of travel, and much, much more. I think you're going to love this interview, so let's get straight to it. Hi, Jack. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on and joining me today. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. I am so excited. I'm so excited to talk about travel. I love travel. So I think it's going to be a really good podcast episode. And Leah, like I said, I'm super excited to be here and chat with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming on. Okay, so let's jump straight into it. Can you tell me where you're from originally and where you live currently? Yeah, so I'm originally from Canada, Nova Scotia, and currently I'm living about 30 minutes outside of Lisbon, Portugal, in the Cinta de area. And it's a beautiful, beautiful area with so much history, and they have like castles, and it's amazing. Uh, now, I've been to Spain quite a few times, but I've never actually been to Portugal, and it's been on my list for so long, so I need to need to get on that. So can you tell me about this big move? When did you move over there? How long ago was it? What was it like? All that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So for me, I'm an elite level athlete. I play soccer in Canada. I was, I was on the top 2008 midfields for my generation. I now play football in the first division of Portugal here. But when I was like 11, my academy director had said it would be a good idea for Jack to go and spe- experience the level of play in Europe before the age of 13. And then... My parents are also entrepreneurs and they had traveled to Europe before. For them, it was kind of like a plan that they would eventually want to live and move and live in Europe because they loved Europe. They were thinking maybe like Paris or the south of France or something. But they always had that idea that that was something that they'd want to do. And then after COVID and the world opened up again, I was 13. And I think in that long transition period where you were in lockdown, you got a lot of time to think about what you really want to do with your life. So my family and I thought a lot about that. And we decided once things opened up again, why not we go and just do it? Why don't we go and take the leap of faith? Wow, that's amazing. I love how supportive your parents are. Can I ask what they do? You said they're both entrepreneurs. I'm interested. Yeah, so they both work for themselves and they are internet marketers and do things like YouTube ads and graphic design and things like that. Oh, great. Okay. So what was it like actually moving there? Like, did it take you a while to adjust? How did that whole process go? Um, One vivid memory I have, like, we arrived in Lisbon, like, really early in the morning in October. So it was still, like, really dark in the morning. I can't remember exactly what time it was, but it was, like, six in the morning, I think. So it was still dark. The sun was just starting to come up. So it kind of looked, like, purpley, you know? 
And I remember thinking to myself, and it turns out my parents had kind of similar thoughts about this. What have we just done? Because we had left everything in Nova Scotia, Canada, and we were building from scratch here in Portugal. And even though we were really excited, it was really just so much disorientation because I know you mentioned Spain in the beginning and what I always wanted to travel to Spain too. So I actually knew some Spanish coming to Portugal, but I didn't actually know Portuguese uh, kind of Portugal. The first time I learned was actually on the plane. And I thought in the beginning I would use Spanish to kind of get through daily conversations. I quickly learned that one, they don't like it when you use Spanish, oh. they prefer using <laughs> two. I found it really difficult to understand, even though I knew some Spanish, they just talk so fast. I think it's different than when you're learning Spanish and then you go mm-hmm. to a different country that has a similar language. They talk really fast. It's all sound like one word. So there's all this orienta- disorientation. We were tired. And, and I guess another thing was just like being so excited for the unknown, but also craving the familiar and that weird contradiction that it has. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of people who have moved can definitely identify with that. You know, the initial like, oh, what have I done? <laughs> like, like yes. is, this, is this a good thing? I don't know. But yeah, like you say, it's it's the initial sort of shock, maybe. And then you sort of start getting used to it. So is this like, is your plan to stay there indefinitely? Or is this like a little detour? And then you're going to go back to Canada? Do you have a plan? Yeah. So when even when we first came to Portugal, we didn't know how long we were going to be staying. We didn't know where we were going to be staying even. We knew we were going to reside probably in somewhere around Lisbon. But when we came, we didn't actually have a house. We didn't do a scouting trip at all. And we didn't realize that people often do scouting trips until we were already <laughs> here. So we had rented like Airbnbs in advance for the first one and a half months, I think. And then we were really lucky that we asked one of Airbnb hosts if we could stay like at their Airbnb like full time as like a renter. So that's what we're doing right now. It's awesome. But as for a plan, it's more like we're going with the flow. We probably will stay here for the next three years, I'm thinking at least. But then there are also so many places that we want to explore still. And like since we are a world child family, we've traveled to a lot of places. We do want to see more of the world. But for right now, we are going to probably be staying in Portugal for at least the next couple of years. Great. That's really exciting. But I wanted to ask, because obviously being a teenager is quite a interesting time anyway. And then you're moving mm-hmm. countries and then you're in a place you don't speak the language. How has it been sort of um, connecting with people or making friends or, you know, like getting over that language barrier? So thankfully, I speak pretty good Portuguese now. People say my accent is very good. I still find it difficult, but I have gotten a lot better and can speak it and can get through life pretty easily. But I would say that definitely took time because you felt homesick at first, obviously, for like all the things they left behind and then the people. So definitely like at least in the beginning, even now, I still talk a lot to my teammates back in Canada that I would train a lot with. But I think what's really been amazing is I've created like good bonds with some of my teammates here in Portugal. And it's kind of funny because like, even though some of them don't always speak English, and even in the beginning, it would be harder to connect with them. But you can unite over like football, soccer, which is a really cool thing. Yeah. And I wanted to ask about that because you obviously moved there primarily because of the sport, the football or the soccer. Have you found differences in, in you know, being in a team in Canada and being in a team in Portugal? Is it very similar or are there sort of things you have to get used to? They're definitely like really different things. Like in Canada, like just in Portugal, in Canada, for my age, I was playing at like the top level, like at the province. I was, I was one of the top players, like at that level, like a really high level in Canada. And then here, like everyone, the speed of play is just so fast. Everyone is extremely good in the ball. And I kind of like a difference is because in Canada, a lot of people go and join like soccer teams for recreation. In Portugal and probably in England too, it's really more ingrained in the culture. So definitely there's that big difference, but there are a bunch of big differences. Like there's promotion and relegation here. They have like different divisions. In Canada, the first division has about seven or eight teams and that's it. I did live in a smaller province of Canada, but still the teams that they have here, like every little area in Portugal has their own team, which I find like crazy. (laughs) But there are definitely a lot of differences. The way how intense it is, like they're even at official games the like military come like our military I don't know if that's the same thing in England but our military will come to the games or like police officers and depending on who's playing it could be two four six 
I don't know if you have that in England, but in Canada, that's like, whoa. Because <laughs> we never have that. Is that because of the like hooliganism? Do you get that? Like British football is well known for like their football hooligans and it's not a good thing. I don't know if it's the same over there, but that's maybe why we would have <laughs> police presence if, if anyone kicks off. Yeah. I'm guessing that's why it is. There's never been like a fist fight. Actually, no, there's been fist fights with the players and the kind of like the coaches on the field, like towards the end. But for the parents, it's mainly for the parents because the parents will actually scream at each other. Like they have, <laughs> like if you're sitting on the same stand, they often scream at each other back and forth. <laughs> so I think mainly just to keep everyone aligned, remember, like to not do anything like to think or things get out of hand, then there are people there to kind of keep things a bit caught. Yeah, I can imagine that's a sort of a weird thing to experience if you're not, if you don't have that back in Canada. Yeah, like <laughs> me and my family, like we were so surprised when I first saw it, we were like, is that military? And we we're like, is this like a rival or something? And then we just kept seeing them like again and again and again and again. And then sometimes there'd be more and we'd be like, what? <laughs> it's definitely a lot more intense. Yeah, it's kind of and a little crazy. Like, so much faster, I think you mentioned. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so as well as doing that, I know you're also a motivational mindset and high performance coach for teen athletes. So can you tell me more about this? How did you get into this? Okay, so like for me, I've always been really into mindset. I think it's helped me a lot. And it's definitely been something that's helped me get to like play at a high level in Canada, bounce back from injuries, and just knowing how to use my mindset to my advantage. Because I have a show called CPL Fever. I've interviewed over 50 professional soccer players and coaches, some even representing the Canadian men's national team. And I, I know how important mindset is to them. But something that I realized was some of the best players, like Cristiano Ronaldo, or even the players that I interviewed, they had good mindsets. And if you don't have a good mindset, that can take you out of the game. And I think it's definitely something that's been an advantage of mine. And I realized that a lot of teen athletes, one, there's just not a lot of coaching and information on that. That's a very small, like, not a lot of coaches pay attention to that. And I realized, like, for me, it made such a difference. So I want to help other team athletes learn to use their mindset so they can get to a higher level. Because it's, like I said, it's been a game changer. And I, even from working with different people, knowing how to use their mindset, it's really, really helped them in their sport. That's so great. And I completely agree with you. I think any aspect of life, mindset is like the pillar. It's the foundation. It's what you need before you can do anything. So how do you actually do this? I know you have like things online do you do it in person like how did you start actually coaching people so uh, it started when I was in Portugal <laughs> so I've always done it like online or virtual I have a website I have a couple of frameworks that I take people through the map method mindset attitude performance because we work on your mindset and attitude to then increase your performance the four pillars of a complete athlete which I'm writing an ebook on right now and then also like really keying into your personality to figure out where your strengths and weaknesses are and that's something that i do with teen athletes but also with teens outside of sports and i've even now done it with a couple of adults which i find crazy oh wow that's amazing so i know you talk about things like overcoming anxiety so people can reach their goals do you use your own experience with this do you read a lot of books do you take a lot of courses listen to podcasts like how do you gain the knowledge around this and the confidence to help other people with it? So for the first part of your question, I would say that myself, like I'm kind of like a seeker. I'm very, I like to soak up a lot of information and I'm very good at finding things that are valuable. And then also like my knowledge can come from a wide array of things from just meeting like other coaches and them having really teaching me something or something like that or listening to a podcast or reading a book. I've gained so much knowledge from reading books and stuff like that. Like I said, my own personal experience, because oftentimes before I'm going to recommend it to someone else, I'm going to try it for myself to see if that actually works for me. It goes through a lengthy process before I'm going to give it to someone. Before I give it to someone, I'm always going to make sure that it's like good and I'm confident that it will work for them. And like I have different methods and I believe that everyone is different. So I'm not just going to have one set thing for everybody I'm going to have a couple different methods and like even in the framework that I do I have like some steps to it but the first step in my 2.0 map method is really about getting clear on your goals and then crafting a plan to achieve them and there are a number I have like about like three different ways that I do that three main ways and I find that it's good to have multiple ways because not everyone works the same 
if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, not everyone learns the same either, do they? Like some people can read, some people need the visuals, some people need to actually go out there and like do it themselves before they can learn. So totally makes sense. I know you also talk a lot about the power of visualization in terms of sports, obviously, but also it can be used for anything in life again, I think. So can you tell me more about this? What do you mean by it? How does it work? Why is it so important? Yeah, so visualization, it's really key because your brain doesn't know the difference between what's actually happening and what's happening in your mind. It doesn't know the difference. And there's this really cool stat. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's pretty close to this. Like there was three groups of basketball players. One just for a month practiced free throwing physically. Another group just practiced in their mind. And then the third group didn't do anything at all. So you can imagine that the third group did not improve that much. <laughs> but the group that visualized, the group that physically shot improved about 25%. And then the group that only visualized improved 23%. So you see that's really close. So if you're able to do both, imagine how much further you'll be able to move ahead, which is a really powerful thing. And for me, I use it when my dad's driving me to my star games or practices, I visualize myself doing well, getting in the right positions, making the right passes and plays and being intelligent on the field. So I think visualization is key for athletes, but it's also key for anyone in life. If I want to achieve a goal, I have like a visualization template and anyone wants to achieve a goal. I have like different areas of my life that I visualize for. Yeah, I love this whole topic so much because I think a lot of people, if they're not into the whole mindset and self-development thing, they might hear something about visualization and be like, oh, what a load of rubbish. But like, as you say, there are so many studies specifically around sports, which is, you know, something you can completely measure. Like you say, the brain can't tell the difference. And if you start visualizing a certain goal, like you say, over and over and over again, then you're more likely to do it because it's sort of more comfortable to you. And when you get to that point, it'll be like second nature to you. You know, you will have already visualized every single aspect of that thing. So even if it's something like I have a fear of public speaking and in one of my books, I talk about visualizing, like stepping out onto the stage at like a TED talk or something and like exactly what I would say, what exactly what I would see, all that kind of stuff. And if you have a goal like that, just to like keep visualizing it over and over and over again. And it's like such a huge help, like you say, for any aspect of life. So I just love that whole area of uh, like self-development and mindset. Another key area, I think, is confidence, which I think is a tricky subject for anyone, no matter what age they are. But I think having confidence as a teenager can be pretty tough. So how do you approach this subject? Say if you have a teen athlete who you're sort of coaching and they're lacking in confidence, how would you approach that with them? Are you ready for adventure? Are you ready to become location independent? Are you ready to create your ultimate dream lifestyle? Then I have just the thing for you. The Flip the Script Academy with me, Jessica Grace Coleman. My online academy, which is bursting with life-changing courses and resources, is for anyone who feels stuck in life, wants to make a change, would like more meaning and purpose in their life, wants to shake things up, especially after the pandemic, wants to start or grow a business or side hustle they can run from the road, wants to incorporate travel into their lives in all kinds of different ways, or is simply ready for an epic transformation. For more info, just head to traveltransformationcoach.com forward slash academy. And now, back to the Travel Transformation Podcast. Yeah, so definitely like for confidence, I think it's crucial for players because you can be one of the most skilled players on the field or be one of those intelligent players and know exactly where you should play the ball. But if you don't have the actual confidence to maybe do a play that you know will be really good, but it's maybe a little bit risky, or don't have the confidence to take someone on one-on-one, -on -one, then you won't be able to impact your team as much and your performance will go significantly down. So oftentimes I work with teen athletes that have been like rejected from a coach or have had injuries and are waiting to get back from them. And those things can really affect your confidence. So some multitude of exercises that I do, it's definitely one of the areas that I have the most exercises because I know how crucial it is. But it's only like a difficult thing to have. But something that I always say to people is that confidence is a trait. It's not like confidence is not a trait. It's a skill. Yeah, definitely. It's something you can learn and build on. Mm -hmm. It's like an, it's also like an action because I find if I'm not feeling confident, if I try to like puff out my chest, look up, smile, 
it's going to help one, it's going to make the illusion that I look more confident, but it's also going to make me feel more confident in myself because I think I look more confident, right? So confidence is really crucial. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of people, they sort of, they put things off because they, they're waiting until they feel confident to do something, but it, they've got it backwards. You need to do the thing to gain the confidence. And if you look at it that way, then, you know, you can definitely build on that as a skill. Uh, and that for me, like, was the same thing, like for us, when we came to Portugal, we weren't exactly like we didn't have like full confidence that everything would be rainbows and sunshine and all be perfect but we gained confidence from taking the tiny steps to do that and i think it's amazing what you can put what you can do when you put like your all your mind and your being and focusing in on something yeah definitely and that's what gives you the confidence to go and do the next thing and the next thing and bigger and bigger things Definitely. Yeah. And can you talk to me a bit about gratefulness? Because I know that's been a big part of your journey as well. Yeah, gratefulness. For me, I think gratefulness is the key ingredient to happiness because I think usually what people get stuck in when they're not happy is they feel like they need external happiness or they need something to feel happy about. But if you're grateful for what you have, then you're going to be happy about that. So gratefulness is super important. But like, I think in the darkest times, you can find things to be grateful for. Like for me, when I was four, I had an autoimmune disorder. I had to travel to the States first to get treatment. First to figure out what was wrong and then get treatment because they didn't figure out what was wrong and they couldn't do treatment in Canada. So I had to go to the States for a little bit to like get that treatment. And even though when you're four, five, six, seven, you don't love going to clinics. I learned more about my mindset. I learned to be grateful that people were trying to help me. I learned how to talk through my emotions and things like that. And something that I like to say is like, even in like some of the most beautiful things can only come to light in the darkest moments. Like think about like constellations. The sky is totally dark, but constellations only come out when it's night. Mm, I love that so much. And I love uh, stargazing as well. So that's <laughs> a great metaphor for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could not agree with you more about that as well. Now, you told me that by the time you were three years old, you'd been on 20 flights <laughs> and yes. many more after that, which is incredible. So you've always been a traveler. I guess you've never really known anything else. So what does travel mean to you? Why is it so important to you? For me, I just love traveling. And so I'm going to say is now because I've been on so many flights, like I'm so comfortable at the airport, on the airplane. It's like, I'm just so comfortable to stay there for hours. I was totally on relay, but I had like one time I had like, 10 hour layover and then a 12 hour layover one of the times that I was going back to Canada for vacation and I was totally fine I just read my book sat in the chair <laughs> and slept and it's I love the airport but I think traveling widens your worldview it gives you greater perspective and for me it makes me feel so free just to be able to fly across the world and experience a totally new culture and that's something that I've loved experiencing here in Portugal because even when you travel I love it. But being able to like really live here for a little bit and experience the culture, it's really, really cool to be able to like live in Portugal. And like I live in a very small town. It's almost like medieval. There's like a small bakery. There is a fish market. There's a food truck that comes. And it's just really, really nice and sweet. And oftentimes also everyone here, it's kind of like an older town. Like so most population is over 50 and 450. The second language is French. It's only recently that the second language has become English. So no one, almost no one speaks English in our town. So it makes me practice my Portuguese better, but it's just like a cool thing to be able to experience it. But I love feeling of being able to like be free and like travel and all of that. I know I talked about a lot of things, but I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're so right. Just the fact that you can jump on a plane, be in another country, be in another culture, Everyone speaking a different language in like, you know, a few hours is it still seems crazy to me like that we can actually do. That. I have a question for you. What does traveling mean to you? Oh, so many things. I've used it as a tool to self-development tool recently to build my confidence, to put myself out there, to do things I wouldn't normally do. I've started staying in co-living places with other people and I'm like a huge introvert. So that's like a massive thing for me, but it's, it's completely opened up my world when you're living with people from like 10 different countries all over the world and you're learning all about their culture, all the, about their upbringing, all about their slang and the, the phrases they use. And like, we're trying to figure out why does your country say this or in our country says that just the little things like that. I love stuff like that. 
I love learning all about different places and obviously meeting people from different places that you can then go and visit <laughs> is also a bonus. But yeah, I love solo travel in particular. There's nothing like it to like boost your confidence, show you how capable you are when you might think like, oh, I don't know if I have the confidence to, or the courage to go out and do that on my own. And then as soon as you do it and you're like, oh, that wasn't bad. That was actually quite good. Then you can go and do the next thing. Like we say, building the confidence muscle. So I love that. And like you say, it is ultimately is just freedom. Like the fact that we can, that we have, you know, we have the passports that allow us to do this. I feel really grateful for that because obviously a lot of people not just do this. So yeah, I completely agree with all that. But I would just like to say, I think you're the only person who's ever said they love airports. Like <laughs> all the other travelers I talk to, like they're so jaded about airports and flights and things like that because I've been doing, on so many, but I, lo I love that. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, it's because like I was in so many airports so young, like, like I said, at the age of like three, I've been over on about 20 flights. And like now I've been around 40. So I just think I'm so comfortable, especially being so young, just being in so many airports, on so many airplanes. I'm just so comfortable with that now. I have fun going there. Yeah, it's just like a normal part of your life, I guess. It's just like one part of, yeah, many. Great. Okay, so I asked you where your favorite places in the world are, and you said Portugal, Las Vegas, and California. And we've obviously covered Portugal yeah. already, but why Las Vegas and California? Uh, California. I know when I said that to you, I was like, oh my gosh, one's a state, one's a city, and one's a country. Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> but California, California, I have my cousins there, and I just really, really loved uh, going to California. Arizona was also amazing. Didn't put that in, but Arizona was also amazing. I really like California though. And Las Vegas, I say not my favorite weather is when it's kind of like the sun has almost like kind of gone down, but it's still warm. And the like place I remember that originating from is just like Las Vegas. I remember like the that weather so clearly. I just love Las Vegas. I love the weather there. I think there's so much fun things to do there. When I was little, when I first went there, we were staying in a hotel that had a casino. And I was so amazed by all the flashing lights and the noise. <laughs> and for me, like four or five, you look at all those bright lights and are like so amazed. It looked like fireworks, but inside. <laughs> so I was like, oh my gosh, so cool. Um, but yeah, the weather, the just the experience, I had such a fun time. I have like a huge sparkly plushy dragon at home from Las Vegas. So I love it. Oh, Las nice. Vegas is amazing. Yeah, I went to Las Vegas just for a few days. I lived in Colorado for a year. I went to university there and we did like a long weekend in Las Vegas. And it's so amazing. It's so surreal. Just, you know, like walking around the street, you don't feel like you're in the States. You know, it's just like it's our own little bubble, isn't it? I like That's what I like about it. Yeah, it's Definitely. amazing. And like whenever I find politics so interesting. So whenever like the US has politics, I always am so interested to see what Nevada will do because I know it's like Las Vegas is in Nevada. Not anything really related. I just love Las Vegas. So by connection, I find Nevada interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice. I mean, I love how it's just like, you know, this crazy place just smack bang in the middle of a random desert. Like it's just, it's just so bizarre. But it's so yeah, amazing. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I've also been to the Mojave Desert, which was really fun. We did like a road trip. We stayed in like, I was little too. And I, I feel like it was like an Airbnb, but not an Airbnb, but something like sort of like that. But it was really cool. But yeah, I had so much fun traveling. Nice. Me too. I could talk about it for hours. <laughs> yeah. There's so many places. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anywhere right now that's on the top of your travel bucket list that you'd really love to go to that you've not been to yet? Yeah. Okay. So Definitely, like, I've always wanted to go to Europe. So definitely hitting, like, Spain, England, France, Germany, Ireland, Switzerland. Those are all countries I want to go to. And now that, like, I'm in Portugal, it would be so much easier just to go. So I really want to do that. And then also, I really like mindset and psychology. But something that I often do is I like learning about myself. I think self-awareness is such an amazing thing to do so i really like these like mbti like the myers Briggs personality test you know them and the anagram yeah yeah so i love them and i was recently talking to someone that lives in an expat that lives in seoul in korea she said mentioned to me that there are mbti like myers Briggs personality type cafes in seoul then i went down a rabbit hole because i was so amazed by this and it turns out before in korea they people would often introduce themselves their, themselves with their name and then their blood type but now they do it like the MBTI craze is crazy over there. And they now introduce themselves with their name and their personality test type. So I really want to go there now. 
I wow, I did not know that. I really want to go to Japan, or like Tokyo and Seoul. It would be so much fun to go there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Japan's top, like a big top on my list as well. I actually have a friend from Seoul. She travels a lot, but she's from there. I'm going to have to ask her about this personality type thing now. That's, that's really fascinating. It's fascinating that they would, you know, say their blood type as well. Like, you know, like cultural differences like that. It's just really, really fascinating. I've read in a couple articles. I haven't actually checked this out with anyone originally from like Korea or Seoul, but it said in an article. And I think now that they introduce themselves with the MV Thai type, even though there's a lot of nuance within every type. I think that's a lot better than introducing yourself with your blood type, which you have like really no control over. <laughs> right. <laughs> it makes a lot more sense. Uh, yeah, I love that because, you know, a lot of businesses and stuff are using it, that, those kinds of personality tests more and more. And there are more and more types of tests these days. Like there's so many appearing, like new ones that I always find that fascinating. Yeah. So that's there's a fantastic one called the saboteur assessment by it's like positive intelligence. And they're like nine saboteurs and it basically shows you what holds you back. And like, for me, when I take that test, I was like, wow, that's interesting. Oh. But for me, I'm an ENFP in the Myers-Briggs, so extrovert, intuitive, feeling, perceiving. And then anagram, I'm a two with a wing three. I have done both of those. I can't remember off the top of my head what I am, but uh, yeah, I've done both of those. But the, the saboteur one sounds really interesting. I'm going to have to look that up now. Yeah, I'll send it to you after. Yeah, I'll send it you. to you after. Great. Yeah. But yeah, I just love like that. And then I like definitely like on our, I haven't mentioned this yet, but we have like a channel about like coming to Portugal and our journey. So definitely like it'd be cool to go to those other places and then also document our journey traveling there as well. But it's been really cool documenting our journey like in Portugal. And now we're kind of two years in, but it's really cool because like almost like home videos, but we're putting it out to the world, which is also really cool. Nice. So that's your YouTube channel. What's that called? Where can people find that? The YouTube channel is called The Unfinished Life. I'm almost positive. Uh, the Unfinished Life. The or an Unfinished Life. Something. Either one of those, <laughs> but I'll send it to you. But it's really cool because like, I just really love talking about travel and like telling our story. It's a really cool thing for me, at least because for me, I've known a lot of people that have wanted to like come and move to Europe. So it's kind of a sign that we want to do also is we want to sh like show people like you can move too. Like you don't have to wait till retirement or you're old or your kids are gone to move. And it's like a really, for me, like it's, I just love being able to be a part of making the videos, do, doing the script. And it's just a really fun process because it's just a really fun process. And I love talking about Portugal and kind of more about the differences between Canada and Portugal and what like life is like for the locals. And I find Portugal so interesting. So I love being able to share about Portugal because of like such a rich culture. And you should totally come to Portugal because it's so amazing. Yeah, you should get on the tourist board, get paid for this because <laughs> you're really making me want to go. So a question about that. You've got your YouTube channel, all the travel stuff, Canada to Portugal, people who want to move. You've got your football, soccer, you've got your coaching. How do you fit it all in? How do you find time for all this? I don't know, but I managed to do it. <laughs> Are you the, I'm guessing you're the kind of person who just gets up and does something. You don't put things off. You just go after things. You don't faff around. You know, I think a lot of people talk themselves out of trying stuff like a YouTube channel or like if they wanted to coach people, they might like talk themselves out of it. So I'm guessing you're the kind of person who would just get on with it. <laughs> and that's how yeah, you do I get on with it often. I, I'm a huge night owl, so I get on with it once it's so dark. <laughs> like I do like, like I'll do my schoolwork and I'll practice soccer in the morning and then as soon as it gets dark, then I, then it's like a new height and sound is coming. I'm like, okay, time to go. It's also like I get more energy though at night when it's like calmer, I guess. Yeah, I'm the same. I'm not a morning person. I can work way better in the evening and that kind of thing. It's just, it's different people, isn't it? Different personality types again, like we were saying. Okay, so I have two last quick questions. First of all, where can people find and follow you online? And I'll put those links in the show notes as well. And then is there anything else you want to mention or any last message you want to get across before we go? For the, where you can find me online, I have a personal YouTube channel called Jack Murray TV, Instagram, Jack Murray HQ, and then like a Facebook page and like a group for my coaching. And I can send those to you like after this call, but if two messages, one for the people that have not moved, give it, just come on, just like be it just make the decision because it will be so worth it it's absolutely amazing living in a new country and i think 
coming to a new country and living here for a little bit, it's made us grow as uh, like all of us as people. And I think it's been amazing. So like really to chase after your dreams and find a way to make it happen because it's amazing. And then for people that have already moved to new, another country, I would say when you move to a new country, there is an amazing opportunity to completely transform your life other than moving to a new country. Because what's really cool is that we're often products of our environment. So oftentimes, if you reorganize your whole house or you move into a new house, it's so much easier to turn a new leaf to kind of improve some of the things that you want to do. So when you come to a new country, everything is different. So even though you're dealing with all of the emotions of like homesickness and come to a new country, if you're able to spend just a little bit of time being really intentional and really deliberately being like the architect of your life, you can make so much happen. Like even just spend 30 minutes and journal about what you want to see in your life, whether it's like material things or you want to get more clarity on this or more confidence um, in general or a bit more disciplined. It's an amazing chance just to really create a lot of action, and a lot of impact in your life. I could not agree more with that. Yeah. Like you say, being the architect of your life, I'm a writer and I talk about being the author of your life. So it's exactly the same thing. I also talk about, I love that. <laughs> I go between, these are the three I go between. <laughs> Artists become, make your life your masterpiece, like kind of like an artist. You like be the storyteller of your life. And I love that because I also love to write. I love to read. I love to write. And then like, I talk to the people I coach about this. And like, I go way more than that because I love the topic. So I'm like, that I have <laughs> so much information on that. And then like a sign that I recently started using too is the architect. And I find that also is the best way to phrase it when you're like traveling because like when you're in a new place it's kind of like you're building from the ground up so it's like you can totally create whatever you want I love that <laughs> but, yeah. yeah exactly you can create the life you want and you can also start taking the steps to become the person you want to become like we all have that person in our minds that we want to become but when we're stuck in the same place we never go anywhere new never try anything new it's very hard to try and take steps to become that person whereas if you say like you're moving to a new place, you don't know anyone, no one knows you, more importantly, you can be anyone you want. <laughs> you can like be that person. Yeah, when you come to a new place and no one knows you, your whole history is basically, you're like a blank slate. Like, yes, you have that accolade, those like accolades or those things about you. But unless you deliberately tell them, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, they're not going to know anything. So it's almost like a totally new way to create like the life that you want to live, which is really cool, a really cool thing. And even for people that aren't <laughs> moving to a new country, even just like doing something like reorganizing your room or putting up new posters or something that inspires you, it becomes like a lot easier. Yeah, definitely. It's all about your environment, like you said before, whether that environment is your place like where you live or your room or a country that you identify with. It's all about that, starting with that and building the foundations and yeah, being the architect of your life. I love that so much. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming on. I've had such a great conversation. And yeah, thank you so much for being a guest today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I had a fantastic time on the podcast and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Travel Transformation Podcast with me, Jessica Grace Coleman. If you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate it if you could please subscribe, rate and review and spread the word because it's my mission to help as many people as possible to flip the script on their lives and transform through travel. And remember, life is short, so let's make sure it's nothing short of amazing. Until next time, I'll catch you on the flip side.